7.02. I call the Monday, May 15, 2023 meeting of the Carver School Committee to order. If everyone could please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Um, I believe I saw Tammy, Tom here as well for comments from the EAPC. Yep, just give me no, one Tammy? second. And just before we begin, Hi. just a reminder. Oh, oh, sorry, Tammy. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> uh, I jumped the gun. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, just a reminder, this meeting is all is being held virtually in accordance with the Mass the Governor of Massachusetts March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. <clears throat> Members of the public can access this meeting in three ways. Uh, they can access it via Zoom, uh, live on Area 58, or in Meeting Room 1 at the Town Hall. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot about the announcement. <laughs> so, welcome, Tammy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, just now, my video is, um, I can't open it. We, Tammy, just made your call, so you should be able to turn your video uh, on now. There you are. All good. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Tim. Um, I just wanted to say it won't take up too much time, but I just wanted to say that um, we, I was lucky enough to be part of um, some collective teachers across the Southeast region, Pembroke, Kingston, Plymouth, Carver, Bourne, um, to meet with the Senator Susan Moran uh, and legislative representatives Kathleen Lanata, Lanatra, sorry, and Matt Maturk, um Meritori to talk about some of our local issues that are coming up um, across the, the um, state. They, some of them, not not just um, not just these things, but some of the main things we discussed were reinvesting in public um, education, the end of high stakes tests, the right to strike, and ensuring a dignified retirement. Um, really, uh, to, to be able to keep um, the teachers in the classroom that we have. We are trying to do our best to pass these the important legislation that will help support our teachers in the coming years. So that was something that I wanted to share. And as we finish out the last year, um, we look forward to working, continue working on the local level with the Health and Safety Committee, the Scheduling Committee, and um, all of the other committees that we have um, set up to prepare us for um, us to do our best for our, and for all of our students. So thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to the comments from the general public portion of our meeting. Um, so if there's anyone in the room that would like to um, speak, you're more than welcome to. Um, actually, it looks like we don't have a microphone on the table, but we will certainly get one um, for someone to use if someone wants to come up and um, make a statement. Um, if there's anyone that's participating online in Zoom that would like to make a statement, you are welcome to speak. If you could please just put your name into the chat to be recognized. Looks like we have a number of people online with us this evening. So again, if you're on Zoom and you would like to speak, um, just please put your name in the chat. Is there anyone here that would like to speak? And no movement in the chat either. Okay. All right. Seeing no movement to the microphone or in the chat, um, we will move on. Do we have um, captain's council? No, we just have. We're moving on to uh, approval of the minutes. Approval of minutes. Following the agenda. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, I'd be looking for a motion to approve the April twenty fourth, twenty twenty three open session minutes. I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from. I'm sorry. What was the date? April 24th. April 24th, 2023. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to um, communications. Are there none? <coughs> there are none. No communications. Okay, okay great. So we're moving right along to um, reports from the superintendent. So since our last meeting, we do have some personnel updates. We have some new hires. Uh, ben Vitale is a long-term substitute physical education teacher at Cabin Middle High School. Uh, Sue Spillane is a long-term substitute communications teacher at the Middle High School. Uh, and Nicole O'Neill is a special education teacher at the Middle High School for next school year, for the 23-24 school year. And we did have one resignation. Aliza Nantes is a bus monitor in special education. Okay, thank you for that update. 
So next, that brings us to um, Carver <coughs> Recreation Programming. Yeah, so we're the school committee would like, wanted to invite Emily Slavin from Carver Rec to come here this evening, kind of give an overview of our summer programs. Uh, so Emily, thank you for being here. We're excited about uh, hearing what the opportunities we'll have for uh, the residents of Carver coming up this summer. Well, just thank you for having me. Just give me a second to open yeah. up the presentation. Absolutely, yeah, thank you for joining us. It was a good idea. Sorry, Zoom. Be, Zoom has because I think I said this at the last meeting. Yeah, the new Zoom's format. Zoom's actually become new for a new format that's more difficult. You have to open something up and then you have to reshare it. There we go. There it is. Okay. So I just wanted to say thank you for having me. I thought it was a great idea. You know, we work closely with uh, the school and a lot of teachers, so I'm excited to share what we have so far this summer, um, and we definitely have more stuff to come. Um, so to start here with this slide, I just wanted to introduce the Carver Recreation Committee. Um, myself, Emily Slavin, I'm a part-time recreation coordinator. I do have a full-time job that I work uh, during the week, but I work this nights and weekends and seem to always be on call. Um, ask Ron, he is too. <laughs> um, so I wanted to introduce the committee members that couldn't be here tonight. We have our president, Mary Ross, who has been a staple for Carver Recreation for so many years. She totally um, helps in everything she can. Her and her husband, Ray, are s such a great asset to this town. So kudos to Mary. We have our vice president, Carl Miller, who's been on the committee for quite some time. Um, he brings a lot of his past experience uh, with his children, uh, growing up with youth sports and um, a lot to the table. We have Caprice DeRoche. Um, she came on wanting to see pickleball come through and exciting that did pass this um, town meeting and so we've already that's gone underway. So we also have Anthony uh, Fullmine, he's new to the committee and we have Jackie Lake who sits here in front as also a representation here at the school committee. So newer to the recreation. And so I just wanted to give a, while we, sorry, go, it can stay on the slide, but I just wanted to give a little introduction to Rec Committee and some of the things we do outside of summer. Um, so we do free events all year, um, which usually around holidays. Um, we try to do free things for the town. We're also at Carver Night Out giving away free items. Um, and that's all done from our budget for the year. We do, um, we do pay for all, um, split the porta potty cost with the school. We pay for them at the town fields, also at Pond Street, and it's a toss up whether it comes, what account comes out of the ponds for the year, so it's kind of who can do it. And the crazy thing is those prices have really, really increased, as you guys probably know from the school side of it, so that's a large portion of recreation's budget. Um, we do field maintenance, um, so we work with the youth sports, we do charge fees, we try to do field maintenance, we work with um, uh, operations, we also are maintaining the playground and we'll maintain the pickleball court, so just wanted to add that. And we only meet monthly, and our next meeting is May 24th, anybody is always welcome. It's not always the same day, but we do post it, um, and it usually is a Tuesday or Wednesday, but we do meet monthly. So um, I'm the only one working in between the like month as far as like I go to the committee for questions and they help with all the free events. But as far as the summer clinics, it's kind of been uh, something I ran with um, when I took over. So here, just a little bit about 2023 summer clinics. The history of recreation is that we've only been in this position of, you know, I think it's almost been four years. Um, and we continue to grow our summer camps. Last year in 2022, we we're able to offer 10 weeks of camp. So that's pretty cool. There, um, we do not have a full-time department, so it's not somebody that's always running the camps, it's not like the Y was or anything like that. Um, and we try to keep our pricing very low because we realize the community is looking to do free to low priced items. And that's the exciting thing about having the recreation department is that we can do that for our residents. So we can go to the begin. So I'm really excited about this. Two years ago, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm looking at you. Two years ago, you got a COVID grant to do some programs. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. 
So two years ago, you got a uh, COVID grant to do some programs, and last year, um, Mr. Neath came and asked as recreation, would we partner together to do that? So we were able to post it through the recreation website, but you then were able to pull out a grant again last year to pay for that so that they were offered free. This year, we do have to charge for it, but we've kept it at a very low cost, and we've actually been able to even add things. So here, we have the um, STEAM summer camp. So the target audience for this is raising, uh, rising sixth, seventh, and eighth graders enrolled. And it's just for Carver Public School members, um, students. So we're just keeping it to residents here. The max is 40, and that we held at Carver Middle High School. And they will have two teachers per week. I'm working with Mr. Arruda to set this all up. Um, and the cost is $60 per student. The, all of these things that I'm going to present tonight are actually posted, and I'll go over where you can find them after. And the last two years, this has been extremely successful. Yes. It's a very popular camp, uh, and all the weeks generally fill up. And, yeah. You know, so we're excited about uh, working with REC in terms of facilitating this program. Yep. So we can go through each of the weeks. So the f next slide is week one. So that's July 11th, 12th, and 13th. They're 9 to 12, and this is the DIY science, and I just put a little bit of like what it is. Um, and so they're gonna be able to do some of the favorite exper experiments, activities, and it's gonna be a fun-filled week. So that's week one. Week two theme is eSports and games. So they're gonna be able to learn a little bit about eSports and use some of the eSports equipment in the school. They're gonna play Rocket League, Mario Kart, Smash Brothers, which for this age group is really popular. Um, and then also they're going to do board games, card games, puzzles, and we'll give students an opportunity to create their own too. And so I think for this age group, it's great to have the kids not at home doing all these things by themselves. So this is great. Uh, week three will be robotics. So um, the campus will work with iRobot, complete a set of programming challenges. They're gonna be able to see how the CMHS robotics team works and kind of show them things that are happening in the school. So that's week three. And then the next three weeks are a little bit different. This is something that hasn't been offered before. And this is still the rising sixth, seventh and eighth graders. And this is a number of participants max is 12 so i'm just advertising here first i have not done any posting so if you are like this you might want to get online and register because i think it will fill up quickly so this is at billington c kayak so 41 branch point road in plymouth and this is also working with mr aruda and three other teachers the reason there'll be three is you are on the water so and the reason the max is 12 is because there needs to be better supervision here and the cost is 145 per student, which is still an amazing price to be able to get out and kayak and to do so much more. So if we go to the next slide, this will be three weeks of the same camp. So it's gonna be week four, five, and six, and it's pretty much the whole month of, you know, the large portion of August. And they're gonna be able to ex um, do kayaking. They're gonna do um, explore the lake, do various activities and scavenger hunts, nature, all themed. And I think this will really um, be really well received. And we hope someday we can bring this to Carver and do this on our own ponds. That's our goal. So, um, But we're excited to work with him in Billington C and we were able um, to get some great prices there. So. We also are offering a volleyball summer camp. This has been happening with Mrs. Bardetti for quite some time. It's been well received. She needs at least a minimum of 12, a max of 30. Just to kind of give a little bit of information, I've received a lot of questions because the incoming, oh, you're gonna throw me off without no slides. I don't know who Because <laughs> I don't think mine works here. Um, so this, this is, I've had a few questions here is that we, I, eighth graders want to do it, but if they can try out for this sport, they cannot attend this camp due to MIAA rules. So I've got a lot of questionnaires because the age 12 to 13 is such a straight, you know, some are entering eight, some are not. So it's, um, I will be reaching out to everybody who signs up just to make sure um, that she falls within the regulations she wanted to me to make sure of that. But it's a great way to get them ready to try out for volleyball. Emily, quick question. Yeah. Those are kids going into fourth grade? So, um, go, sorry. It's four to seven, so. Yeah, in so kids going, going into, into fourth, fourth grade. grade. Okay. Yep. Thank you, I don't know why mine's locked, thank you. Um, so that's kids going into fourth grade and all the way going into seventh. Perfect. Yep. 
So it's exciting too because we offer, they'll be able to try out. So yeah. um, we have Cheer Summer Clinic. I want to just do a little shout out for the Cheer. This is something that the Cheer program here in Carver worked with recreation, and I do think that the two teams together have worked really well to build this program. When I first started as recreation coordinator, there was this was a small program of youth sports, and it's really grown between both. Um, the board they have and recreation working together. So they're offering a summer one, but they also offer all school breaks. So it's kind of worked with the Cabra Cowboys Youth Cheer Group and recreation. We keep the price here low. We've raised it a little bit in the summer, but we're also able to work with them to help them get this program off. So we've been able to give some of the price, there've been large amounts of kids who have joined this, so we can give the money back to them and they've been able to purchase mats and working towards, um, we're helping, you know, by doing these clinics, we're helping build the program. So this is for if you want to um, be part of cheer or do not want to, you can attend these clinics, ages five to eight, 430 to six, and ages nine to 12, and um, June 26th to the 28th. We have Tennis Summer Clinic. Um, this year um, we have a um, tennis coach, Mr. Cartmel. I had to mind blank for a second. Um, in the years past, we've also had previous tennis um, players who have done this camp when he was unable. And he's gonna do two weeks, 15th through the 17th and 22nd to the 24th. Um, these are ages six to seven, eight to 10, 10 to 14. They're an hour time span. And this is 50 for residents and 55 for non. As you can see, we raise it either five to $10 for non-residents. In the summer, we try to keep it five because we do understand that there is a lot of school choice too and those kids can attend these, so it's not a problem. Um, and then this could be any out-of-towners. We have football summer clinic. We're working with Ben Shafane and we are doing target ages of eight to 14, and we have a cost of 60 a resident and 65, and this will also, we're working with him, he's also doing this as a football fundraiser, um, so he will have his high school team out there working with the younger kids. But currently, we do have a youth football clinic going on tonight, and we have had summer uh, soccer, I mean spring soccer clinic, so we're doing a lot even throughout the year, just not in summer. And then I just wanted to add that we have something coming. We realize that our elementary school age kids really get missed here a little bit. And so um, with um, you know Terry Sexton moving on and she did do a lot, so we're kind of picking up the pieces here and we're gonna be offering a science camp. Mary Ross is working to get some teachers for K through two and it's called Ooey Gooey Science, so that's coming. Um, those should be posted in the next week or so. We have a soccer clinic um, that I'm working with Nikki Tully to do, and I'm working with a corporation to set up a phone party here in Carver. It will be broken into age groups. The Recreation Committee and myself are working on getting this up. It's a company who does these. We're thinking at Forest Street Field where you could go out and dance and have foam and um, maybe we can do other things that day. And that will be something we'll be charging minimal amount for people to attend. We're looking to add an art camp for those who don't realize we've done a lot of artwork here in the playground and on the baseball fields and we're looking to add something this year. And I would love to bring cooking camp back. So um, if you guys know of anyone, I know that we have some tough times finding someone, um, but I do, would love to bring that back. It was really well received years ago. Um, just a reminder, as I stated, recreation is not a department like other towns, so if you, we hear this a lot, if you go on other towns, you see that they have a lot more camps, that's because they have full-time departments. We are not a full-time department, we definitely do the best we can, and we work with, mostly work with teachers and coaches because that's the easiest. We do not have a space to perform a lot of these events unless it's through the school, so it's easy when you have a summer teacher, a teacher that is looking to make some summer money and to work with them. But that's not opposed that we're not looking for other people to do summer camps. So we can go to the next slide. And if you'd like to register for these camps, you can click on um, carverrecreation.com um, carver and um, it brings you right to our page and then you can see it will under programs and we'll have all the programs and you can register if you have any concerns when registering you can go ahead and um, just send me an email i think the next slide was just my email address at carverrecreation at gmail.com 
at gmail.com. So if you have, and I will get back to you, I usually respond within 24 hours to give you a username and password, um, but this is great. Just a little, again, slower. the Zoom yeah. is slower now. It's not it better, is. which doesn't no. make any sense. <laughs> you would right? think they'd improve it and it would be better. I know. It's not better. So if you go here, this is great, because we get this all. When you say click on the website, I clicked on the website. That's how long it took for it to come up. So if you go here, this is great. If you go under register, you can see that um, to the left, if you register or register now, either one, it will show all the programs that are listed. And um, we do post everything on our social media. So like our Facebook page and that you can see any updates. But I just wanted to share that with you guys today and appreciate you inviting uh, the Cava Recreation. Absolutely. Any questions or concerns? I mean, questions or concerns, I'll take anything. I just want to say thank you as uh, on behalf of the Carver Youth Cheer Board for all of your cooperation. We actually bought our mats today. They'll Yay. be here in about three weeks. Our fall registration is open for anybody who is interested in that program as well. And practice schedules will be posted tomorrow. Yeah, and just so everyone knows, I think this is really good to, to express this is that youth programs do not run through recreation currently our only sports that run through us run and i talk about this all the time is uh wrestling runs through recreation men's basketball runs through back this year was the first time we took that over but the sports are they're independent but we do work with them we book the fields we work with them we work with the school to utilize because you know as crazy as it sounds there's not not enough fields in between the school and the town to even house all the sports we have here which is great not a it's not a problem it's a you know that we're not worried about so we do a we do a lot of work as far as youth sports but they are not run through recreation so that's a little different than other towns i just want to thank you for all the work you're doing uh, to promote the rec programs i do think we're uh, we have a good partnership and we're building on that we partnership do. in terms of using school staff and providing outstanding opportunities obviously for our students uh, but for all the other people of Cairo. So thank so you. So if for there's your work. any teachers listening and they want to run a summer camp, um, I would yes, be happy to audience, propose so. this. And we pay well. <laughs> so thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. For, thank you for all you thank do. You, thank Emily. you for sharing it with us. Very exciting summer happenings. We are super lucky to be able to have a rec committee that's able to offer so many programs within our community. So. Thank you to all of the members. So our, our next two agenda items, I'm actually ex we're excited about uh, telling you about some programs that we've been running at the middle high school. Mm -hmm. uh, so first is the Anti-Defamation League Rule of Difference program, uh, which uh, Mrs. Winslow is the facilitator for that program. And we have several students here who are gonna be here to talk about it a little bit. Uh, I wanted to give just a little background. You know, we've partnered with the Anti-Defamation League since 2013 in implementing what's called the Role of Difference Program. The program is a peer leadership program where a group of high school students are trained to be peer leaders and implement a program with middle school students. Peer leaders learn to understand and challenge bias and bullying, practice facilitation skills, take on leadership roles in the school, while positively impacting school culture, modeling respect, allyship, and civility. This year we had over 20 high school students who were trained as peer leaders and some of them are here this evening. Um, and we're currently implementing the program with our sixth grade students at the new high school. So at this time I'd like to invite Trish Winslow as the advisor and I believe uh, the students Amanda Byron, Leo Lyman, uh, Demetrius Papustis, I always want to check that name, Emma Robbins, Sarah Stairs, and Dylan Young. Uh, and I know we only have two seats at our table. <laughs> And, and then as you've seen, the, the Zoom is a little slow, so give me a second to get your presentation up. Thank you for having us tonight. We're excited to talk about the World of Difference program. Um, this year, we do have 24 peer leaders who were trained in the program. They're going to, we have a few here tonight, as Ms. Dean said. They're going to talk to you about the program and also talk, and also um, show you a lesson, that, <coughs> part of the lesson that they have presented to the sixth grade students this year. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the peer leaders since they're going to talk about the program. So the um, earlier this year, we 
had an informational meeting where we were looking for 9th, 10th, and 11th grade students to become part of this program. So they attended a meeting, we explained what it would entail, and from there they needed to apply to be in the program. Um, and basically they let, um, they let us know why they wanted to be a peer leader. Um, they need to be in good academic standing and good role models because they are working with the younger students in the building. So from there, the peer leaders attended a full two-day training with representatives from the World of Difference Institute. So during those two days, they worked very hard. They participated in many discussions involving diversity, bias, bullying behaviors, and also participated in some of the activities that they would be teaching to the sixth grade students. So it's, it's a lot um, for them because they were missing their classes. They're all extremely involved and very busy. They're in everything. So it's a commitment for them. So from the two days of training, then they started to meet um, once a week with me and Mrs. Cabral as well, who helps with the program and we did some of the lessons that they would be teaching to the sixth grade students. Um, they, worked, they worked with their group, they planned, and then a few months ago they started going into the classroom. So I do give them a lot of credit for joining this program. In previous years we've always had a, a veteran group of peer trainers, but due to the pandemic, we last year, it was our last group that had actually ever been trained. So they're at, they started from scratch. So they have, um, they've done a really nice job working with the students. So I'm, I'm very proud of them. So they're going to um, introduce themselves and go through the program and talk about some of the work they've done this year. Great, thank you. Okay. So I'm Dylan Young, uh, I'm a junior at Carver High School and I decided to become a peer leader to create a safe uh, and fun learning environment for all students at Carver Middle High School. All right, I'm Leo Lyman. I started, I joined this program because I thought it'd be fun to work with the kids. I enjoy like, you know, working with kids, teaching them and you know, it's a great message to be spreading around the school. Sarah, I'm sorry, if you don't mind just sliding the yeah. mic across so that everybody hears yep. you at home. We can hear you in the room. But uh, that makes sure everybody can hear you at home. Um, I'm Sarah Stairs. I'm a sophomore. And I wanted to become a peer leader because I remember being in sixth grade and learning all this. So I really wanted to teach it to the upcoming sixth graders. That's great. I'm Amanda, and I'm a sophomore. And like Sarah, I just wanted to be able to spread the great message to all the sixth graders that I received when I was little. Thanks, Emma. <laughs> I'm Emma Robbins, I'm a sophomore, and I joined because I also remember doing it in sixth grade and just thinking it was a lot of fun and learning a lot of things that definitely helped me and were benefited me, so I wanted to do that and also just create a safer and more helpful space in the school. Great. So we want to talk a little bit about what the World of Difference program is. Like Mr. Neef said a couple minutes ago, the idea is this anti-bias, anti-bullying. We want to teach everybody to be inclusive of each other and make a welcoming community within the school where everybody's equitable, everybody's working together, a nice and inclusive, cohesive community. So this is the, the Luddy Zakem Memorial Bridge in Boston. Most of you probably recognize it. And it's named after Leonard Zakem, who is the founder of the Anti-Defamation League. And so we every lesson we teach to the sixth graders, we start out by showing them this. It's a nice visual representation. <clears throat> and then these are some of the activities that we've done with them. So the identity icebergs, we took like a picture of an iceberg, the idea being that an iceberg represents a person's personality with the tiny little bit that's above the water you can see and the big bit underneath that you can't see. The star patterns, we had them fill out some stars with things that they identify with. Identity sculptures, we had them build some pipe cleaner sculptures that they, you know, represents their identity. And you guys will see a little bit more of that later. We did a birthday timeline where they order themselves with their birthdays without talking to each other. So they have to work on some different methods of communication. 
Um, spontaneous combustion is this little activity where we give them a card, we bring them to the front of the classroom, and they have 30 seconds to talk about whatever's on that card. Wherever they want to go with it, that's fine. But they can't sit down until their 30 seconds is up. And then what makes a group is an activity where we have them all stand in a circle and we give them an identifier. So you might say, who likes the color blue? And they have to find people that have the same grouping or likes as them. And that kind of shows them the differences into people's opinions, but also that that's an okay thing to have. So at the beginning of all our lessons, we start with reviewing our school motto, which is be respectful, be responsible, and be the best you can be. So being respectful would be treating, the other, treating others the way you would want to be treated. Being responsible would be identifying what you can do or say to help prevent, intervene, hurtful behaviors that happen in the school. And being the best you can be is being open to everyone's ideas, beliefs, and experiences. So one of the first lessons that we do with the sixth grade students is we have a big giant uh, post-it note that we hang up at the front of the classroom and we have just as it is set up here with the word respect written out and we have them get into small groups and what they try to do is they come up with words um, that begin with each of the letters in the word respect um, that should be ground rules not only in the classroom and where they're teaching but also in their personal lives in school at home. Um, then they usually write it down on a sticky note and then put it where each of the letters would be. We would share it with the class, what everyone came up with, write about four to five for each letter, and we have that poster hanging during all the lessons as just a reminder that these are the rules that they worked together to create to make sure that it's a safe uh, space for everyone. And then the two words on the right there, oops and ouch, uh, we tell them about the importance of if you say something that hurts someone's feelings, you should say oot, you should say oops. Um, and if you, someone said something to you that you thought was hurtful, that you should say ouch, and the other person would say oops. So in one of our lessons, an activity that we did with the sixth graders was the identity sculptures. And basically the purpose was, of it was to show how different and how similar they are to each other and how they might have not realized that. It increased awareness of the role identity plays on how people see it in the world. It developed an understanding about the impact of trying to understand aspects of one's identity and it um, helped them realize that to, you had to develop a safe, respectful environment at Carbon High School. So basically what it was is we would give them pipe cleaners and we like to like engage them in it and give them a chance to be creative and stuff. So we would give them three different uh, pipe cleaners and for each pipe cleaner they would mold like um, the pipe cleaner into a certain shape um, depicting like what a certain aspect of their identity. So like for example, you could do like a heart representing like your love for your family or your friends and you do that for two others and then we would, um, if they felt comfortable with it, they would show it to the class and describe their sculptures by saying I am and what it is and why it is important to them and how it shows uh, an aspect of their identity. And just how Emma was saying, once they finished making their sculptures, we go around and if they're comfortable saying, we have them explain each part of their sculpture and how it connects to each other to form like their identity and how it is important to them. Thank you very much. That was an outstanding presentation. Thank you for taking the time and, sh and sharing with us all the great things that are happening uh, in the World of Difference program <laughs> with the goal really of um, having us all work together as a school community mm -hmm. to be safe and supportive for all students. That's really, that's really the goal. And this is a program that uh, has been implemented to um, achieve, help achieve that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for all Anyone? Anyone have any questions? It's a tremendous opportunity. Thank you so much for making this program available to um, our students. Um, I look forward to hearing more about their um, lessons and teachings. Um, it's just it's it's great. This is one of those things that um, 
it's important for us to highlight, right? Because unless you're involved, you might not know the program exists. Um, so thank you for coming tonight and for sharing it with us and for bringing it to our district. So thank you very much. Trish Tr Tr is going to be up again. Yes. Uh, so uh, as it is yeah. friends, so the second program we want to share with the committee that happened this fall, I'm sorry, this spring, and it's happening again actually, we have two sessions, nice. is called our Safe Sitters Program. Uh, and it's being facilitated by Mrs. Winslow, and this is Mrs. Grady, Mrs. Schoen, and Mrs. Townsend. Um, and we're happy to have some students here with us. Uh, Samantha Canali, Olivia Courage, Corinne uh, Sincere, uh, Mila, <coughs> Mila, I hope I say your name right. Salisic, no, Salisic. 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 There we go. Mila Salisic and Liliana Moretti. Um, so we actually did a safe center program for students in sixth grade as during WIN. Uh, the program provides students with uh, essential training in terms of babysitting skills uh, and the work that need the work you, and skills you need to be a babysitter. And at the end, all the students are certified as babysitters. So the, they're going to be here to give us an overview of the program. Give me a half a second again so I can get it up on the Zoom. Welcome. Thank you for being here and um, sharing your experiences with us. We love to hear from students, so thank you for bringing them share their voice. Um, so as Mr. Neve said, um, we started this program as a result of the <coughs> wind blocking implemented at our school. Um, as a group, we were looking for something meaningful to offer to the students, and as a group, we came up with this idea and certified trainers and brought it to this great group of students. It's just us. Okay, go next time, next time. <laughs> that, that's that. Uh, but I don't know if you should all introduce yourselves. Yeah, so please, 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 please do. Please do it. Please, yeah, into uh, a microphone as well so everyone at home can hear. Hi, um, I'm Trisha Winslow. I'm the guidance counselor at the middle school and department chair for the middle high school. Thank you. I'm Angie Townsend. I'm the speech pathologist at the middle high and the special ed department chair for the middle high school. Excellent. Thank you. I'm Karen Schoen, the school nurse at Carver Middle High School. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jesse Grady. I'm the school psychologist and team chair at the middle high school. Thank you. So the Safe Sitter program um, was established um, from a woman who had experience with loss. Um, somebody, had, uh, a small child, had um, lost their life due to choking, and they thought that they needed to establish a program to teach children and babysitters how to be proactive and know the dangers and what was essential for babysitting, so that came to be about. So we started for grades six through eight. We had a large... Um, population of students who wanted to participate so we Great. decided to start through the grades um, so our first group was sixth graders and now we have a seventh grade group um, and so there's role playing and videos and a lot of discussion um, and teaching throughout and then they become certified at the end so our thank you so North Star Refrigeration in Plymouth Massachusetts actually funded um, a lot of our startup costs so they donated um, and started the cost for 28 students to become certified. Okay. So all their materials and what they needed. Um, a family of our CPR mannequins so that they could demonstrate their knowledge of CPR skills. Um, the dolls for diapering, our swag, and our training <laughs> nice. um, for the four of us to become um, trained, certified, and um, they plan to donate more money next year so another round of 28 students can be um, certified as well so that's free of charge for the students to become certified babysitters and start their little um, you know ventures into employment world um, and then we also wanted to thank our students they were a great group they were very enthusiastic and then our administration and the win opportunity to be able to do this for for the kids that is awesome so, so my job was to introduce these fine young safe sitters. Um, Mr. Neve already read their names. Uh, I did want to, she said we had a huge response. When we first put out an email looking for 
uh, students who might be interested. I think we had over 80 responses wow. Wow. in just the sixth and seventh grade. That's so it amazing. really came, we decided to focus on sixth grade as kind of our pilot program. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of did a lottery system and we had a great, great group of kids. Uh, so they want to introduce themselves and they're going to tell you a little bit about why they wanted to be part of this babysitting group and what they hope to be to get out of it. And then they're going to talk a little bit about what we, what we did during the group, okay? Um, hi, my name is Olivia Courage. I'm in sixth grade um, and I wanted to become a babysitter because when I was little um, I actually had a few babysitters that babysat me and my um, parents, every time my parents would leave to go out for like a date night or something, I would feel very like sad out because I was very close with my parents and just seeing them leave, it just made me sad. So, but then when I got um, some good babysitters, they made me feel welcome and we did a bunch of entertaining like activities like watching a movie or playing a game and it just made me feel so much better and almost as I'd made like friends um, and I was around three or four at this age so it felt nice. Um, so I kind of just wanted to become that and give young or like people younger than me that feeling that they can feel safe and welcome in this area and that I can like show them new stuff. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm Corinne Sincere, and I became a babysitter because, uh, I don't know, wait. <laughs> <laughs> just like the idea of helping people, like, I don't know, I just want to be able to help people and stuff like that, and money. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm Eula Tlaisic and I want to become a babysitter because I really like kids and they're really fun to hang out with. <laughs> and also the money. <laughs> and um yeah. Hi, I'm Samantha Canelli and I decided to be a babysitter because I have um, a lot of younger cousins, and I have a little sister. So, like, I, you know, thinking of like I could babysit them and get some money because I have a lot of vacations coming up this summer. <laughs> I'm Lily Moretti, and I wanted to be a babysitter because I like to like just help kids, and I have a little brother that I can babysit, and he's kind of crazy, um, but. Yeah, and just like being a babysitter and like helping people. You guys talked about money. How do you, how do you tell somebody that what your rate is? Mm -hmm. I, I pay this much an hour. Are you okay with that? I charge this much an hour. Are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. So some topics we covered were safety skills, oh, chi chi <laughs> child care skills, <laughs> behavior management, first aid and rescue skills, stage of child development, um, life and business skills, and safety in online world. So the safety phrase is like if you don't feel comfortable or you're not safe, you say, I want to be, I, mm, I'm ready to be picked up now. And it's basically telling your parent, I need to be picked up now, questions asked later, because I need to get out right now. Uh, so ASAP is um, an abbreviation for um, ABLE, safety, availability, and permission. Um, ABLE means like, are you free and if you can take this job? Safety means like, let's say there's like a vicious dog that you don't feel comfortable <laughs> um, being near. So you pick if you want this job or not, considering that. Um, availability kind of goes with ABLE. If you're like not able to make it and if you're not free, and permission, you have to get your parents' permission before any of these because they're, they have control over you. <laughs> um, best routine is the B stands for bedtime, 
The E stands for entertainment, the S stands for snacks and meals, and the T stands for toileting. How to, how to charge for um, babysitting or declining babysitting. Um, for charging, you could like say like I I, um, I charge like 10 bucks like an hour, like five bucks. And then declining is like, oh, I can't, I have, I can't like take this babysitting job. I have a basketball meeting or like anything, or I made plans, or I made plans with my family to go to like a birthday party or something. I know it's cut off there a little bit. Oh, I right. know. Yeah. <laughs> managing difficult situations. So, managing difficult situations means like if like a kid got hurt, you have to figure out if you can if you manage it yourself, call a backup adult or call 911. <laughs> Um, can I have the paper? Yeah. Um, so, some of the stuff with um, managing difficult situations is diapering. Um, so, I don't know if you're able, I don't think you're, like, for your first few years of babysitting, you can't really babysit um, little kids under, like, one. You should probably go for kids over that age just so you understand and you're able to actually take care of them without problems. So diapering, but still for toddlers, that still might be a problem. So um, I don't really, I can't really demonstrate it. <laughs> but um, sure yeah, it, right? yeah, we learned it. Um, for choking rescue, oh, <laughs> okay. For choking rescue, we learned how to do abdominal thrust and. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, we basically just learned how to do it and we demonstrated it on dolls. Yeah. Um, so for CPR skills, we learned how to do it on different, like an adult or a kid and on a baby and how you have to do different things. So like you have to do different, like for the baby you have to do back blows and then switch them and then that. Wait, no, that's choking. No, you're, you're right. No, you're, you're right. right. Yeah, you're right. And then um, the for the we learned how to do CPR on adults and kids. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Those are some pictures of us. <laughs> oh yeah, we were. So there were a lot of hands-on demonstrations, a lot of interactive role playing. Teaching the CPR with our mannequins. The kids all made these posters. Um, kind of on their own. They all made posters and decorated the library for us. Um, so these are some more pictures of them doing the different demonstrations. And I think the next slide. Yep, so this is where they all came out. They got their certificate. Books. Um, we also had parents come to the graduation. Some, so the parents yeah. were invited. A lot of them came. Administration came. Mr. Heath was there. It was a real, really nice day. Yeah, they were able to do some actual demonstrations for like choking and CPR. Oh, fantastic. Great. Awesome. Thank, thank you very awesome. much. Quick question. Students, I'll do the outstanding job. Or a babysitter. <laughs> How would we do that? What? We what? Were Sorry. <laughs> what if we wanted to hire you as a babysitter? How would we get in touch with you? Um. <laughs> Have we not thought that far? Uh, you could um like email us. Mm -hmm. uh, we each have school accounts which have our own emails and I'm sure Correct. some some of us have our own. Um, most of us have like a phone number so you can um, message us or call us um, for an appointment. Yeah, we should have a directory. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, or, or you could yeah, get you us really through our parents. Have a directory. That works. Because yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of people who would utilize yeah. your services. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And through the safe center trainers as well. Can we go through you? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Because we did talk a lot about online safety and yep. posting online. Mm -hmm. and I think this would be a great opportunity f too for town meeting. Yes. Okay. Because a lot yeah. of people this year had trouble coming to town meeting because they didn't have sitters. 
and normally they do, I think this would be a, a good way to kind of integrate all that. I would just like to um, say, ladies, know your worth, because I heard you say something about $5 an yeah, hour. No. <laughs> yeah. too low. You, you've yeah. got too much knowledge <laughs> to be undercutting yourself like yeah. that, okay? You are certified now. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> We're free if you want us to, um, to, for your kids, <laughs> so. <laughs> right. All right, girl. Well, thank right. you very much. Thank you. Another amazing program, right? Thank you, thank you so much for, for coming. Thank you for bringing the program. Thank you for coming and sharing your stories. It's so great when we have students come and share what they're doing in our buildings. It just brings me such joy. It's just so great to see. My sister Zanny's friend. The two of us together are wild, so I know that girl knows what she's doing. That's great. Thank you for helping with the seating arrangements, Mrs. Cabral. Thank you for that. Thank you. Oh, that was so great. Now I love that. Right? Okay, so that brings us to... Day on the Hill. Day on the Hill. So on Thursday, May 5th, uh, Stephanie, myself, Katie, uh, Corinne Clarity, Shana Strusky, and Dylan Young <coughs> uh, attended the MASC Day on the Hill. Uh, we did have the opportunity to meet with Representative Susan uh, Williams Gifford and an aide from Senator Pacheco's office. Um, in your background, I linked the legislative priorities, which lists, I think there were actually 20 this year, mm -hmm. uh, specific legislative priorities outlined by MASC uh, that they were asking us to go and speak to our representatives about, uh, which we, as I said, we had the opportunity to do that and to advocate for uh, things we'd like to see or, or as a school district in change, you know, mm -hmm. in the state at the state level in terms of pending legislation. Um, so I'm just going to talk about five of the specific uh, legislative priorities that I thought were relative, relevant. Obviously, uh, Katie or Stephanie, you can add or detract from the list that I selected. Um, so number one uh, was full funding of special education circuit breaker. Uh, we're all advocating, MASC this year is actually advocating for 90% reimbursement. And Mr. Griffin, I don't know if you heard that number from anybody. Uh, over the currently budget, 75%. Nice. And in previous years, actually, the, the law has called for 75% reimbursement on Circuit Breaker, uh, but in many years, the legislature doesn't actually fund it at 75%. Uh, since the pandemic, they've pretty consistently been funding it at 75%, so that's been a little bit of a change. Uh, so MASC is saying, well, let's do a little bit better uh, and see if we can get to a 90% reimbursement rate. Uh, they're also looking to reduce the threshold uh, by 25%, allowing for more special education costs to be eligible for reimbursement. Uh, just in terms of special ed circuit breaker, maybe I should have started with this for our audience out there that's listening. I'll give a really high level overview uh, in terms of what circuit breaker is. So in essence, uh, what the state says is that if, you're, um, if you have a special education cost for an individual student uh, that is two times the foundation budget, which I'm going to throw a number out, which is approximately around $45,000. That if your cost for that one student is over forty-five thousand dollars in one year, and forty again forty thousand approximate, um, then you get reimbursed by the state the next year. Mm -hmm. But they don't reimburse a hundred percent of that cost; they reimburse a percentage. Uh, and as I said, the law states that it's seventy-five percent subject to appropriations. But on a year-to-year -year basis, in many years previous to the pandemic, they didn't even fund circuit breaker at 75%. Though, as I said, the state's done a, a better job in the last couple of years of funding at 75%. And I believe in both versions of the budget for this year, and it's being funded, the proposal both by the House and the governor. Uh, I, and I don't know about the Senate's budget. I believe it had it. Uh, they, all have it they all have it at 75% for this year. But MA, MASC is actually looking to have it be a little higher than 75%. The other piece of that is this whole concept of uh, what the threshold is. MASC is also saying, let's lower the threshold. Instead of the number being $45,000, let's, let's lower that by 25%. So that would obviously bring more funding back to individual towns. Mm -hmm. Circuit breaker funding comes a year behind. So we get the, re the reimbursements we're receiving this year are for last year's special ed cases, if that makes sense. So it comes mm -hmm. one year in the rear. Uh, because they have to look at the cost. You have to say for the, you know, because a student might 
move or it might change placement or so they look at okay this is what it was last year for you these are students who qualify in the circuit breaker here's the amount of money you're going to receive over uh, four periods um, so obviously the goal here is special ed costs are all, a dr always a drive for everybody you know as we said when we looked at this year's budget uh, special ed costs were, were going to be up for us now we wouldn't see that circuit breaker reimbursement until the next fiscal year because it's a year behind uh, but obviously we're always advocating for um, the legislator, legislature to find ways uh, to carry the burden of some of those really high uh, placements for individual students. You know, so an individual student placement can run anywhere from that $50,000 range to $200,000 depending on the individual needs of the students. Um, so uh, we would always be supportive of uh, the state doing as much as they can to support us on our special education costs. Uh, the second one I would identify <clears throat> is what uh, MASC is calling the Children's Service Safety Net. Uh, MASC is advocating for increasing funding for state agencies that support students. And that's in saying that this is really, a, this is a global issue. The school can't solve all the issues and all, or manage all the challenges that students face. So that the state should, beyond funding schools, should also be funding um, you know, those other areas like mental health. Uh, Food services, healthcare, you know, what are all DCF, you know, what are all the state agencies that are out there to support children? It shouldn't only let's not fund the schools only, let's fund everybody. Let's let's fund the entire network of state agencies that are supposed to be working together to support all of our students. So certainly we would be supportive of uh, increasing funding in all those areas because those supports will help all of our kids. I know this is a, a passion of, I think, everybody on the school committee uh, and everybody within our community is maintaining the free breakfast and free lunch for all students. Uh, you know, so there, that's clearly a point of advocacy for MASC. Um, the fourth one I would identify is uh, rethinking the state accountability system. Uh, MASC is advocating for the rethinking of the purpose of the MCAS test, uh, possibly eliminating the MCAS graduation requirement for 10th grade students or students before they graduate. Uh, and limiting the use of test results uh, to diagnostic and professional practice improvement for educators. Mm -hmm. Say, so they're not totally saying let's get rid of MCAS. They're saying let's, let's modify what we do with it. So it's, we have this data, maybe the data is important, but maybe we shouldn't tie it directly to a graduation requirement. Or maybe we should just be using it to see and help students grow. Using it for those purposes. Uh, then more of the high stakes piece. Um, and then the last one, um, number five, uh, establish incentives for more students to become educators and or remain in the field to serve children where, in, where they're in the most need. You know, ultimately, I think that this is going to become a priority. Uh, over the last year or two, we've, it's become more challenging uh, to hire staff. Uh, we as a district in particular are seeing the difficulty really in hiring some special education positions, uh, which is a little bit of a shift. Uh, so we used to have a pretty robust um, application pool. And it's thinner than it has been in previous years. And I think we need to be looking at encouraging uh, students coming out of, out of high school and out of college uh, to pursue careers in education. So MASC is saying, let's make that a priority and see what we can do to establish some incentives to have students want to uh, leave college uh, and go on and uh, join the education workforce. So those are the five that I pulled out. And certainly I would turn it to Stephanie or uh, Katie, if they had any other thoughts on uh, the priorities and the, or what happened or our discussions on that day. Um, I just would like to say that it was excellent getting to spend the day with the three students and see how passionate they were about pretty much the same issues that we are passionate about. Um, and like they're taking control of their own education. I found that extremely impressive and they were wonderful young people. Um, and it was great to be able to get a chance to have our voices heard on things like the MCAS and the free lunches and to let um, Susan know that it was that those were things that were very important to us and to our community. Agreed. I love student voice. Like having all of the students join our meeting tonight, it's they're why we're here, right? They're what we're all working towards. Right, creating that safe, supportive um, environment where they can learn and grow, and you know, exceed even their own concept of what their potential could be. Um, so it's always great to have um, student voice. And I, one thing, one common theme I've heard throughout the last I don't know a year and a half with MASC and working 
in advocacy in conjunction with them and the NSBA is how um, the legislative body really wants to hear that student voice. So um, it was great that we had some students go. Mm -hmm. The timing was a little um, difficult for challenging for some students because it was in the middle of AP exams. So we were fortunate that we had um, a few stu three students join us. Some other districts had more, some other districts had less, some had none um, because of those challenges with um, AP exams. So and that's uh, AP exams and also uh, athletics is always a challenge yeah. just because they have right. games after school and if you go into Boston for the day, it's hard to get back for a game after school. Right. So, um, but it was great to have um, students there. Um, so one thing I want to um, highlight, not in terms of priorities, but just in terms of some of the programming that they had, um, we got to hear from um, Representative Denise Garlick. Uh, she's the House Chair of the Committee on Education, and Representative Steve Altrino, who's the House Vice Chair on the Committee on Education. And they are both so passionate about um, public education. Um, she was a nurse. Um, he was a teacher. Um, they've both served um, in a multiple, multitude of different roles, and they're both very excited um, to be on the Committee on Education, and they also want to hear from us. They want to hear from, um, you know, they want to hear from administration, they want to hear from school committees, they want to hear from students. Um, so it's, again, it's another opportunity for us to, you know, use our collective voices and um, advocate for improvements. Um, so it was really, I thought, they were both great speakers. They were both, um, you could see how passionate they were. They were very engaging. Um, so I would like to see us, you know, do a little bit more um, in terms of sharing our stories with them because we do have so many amazing stories to tell. So um, I'm excited to continue to share those things, especially when you have people, you know, people's on the, people on those committees that are as passionate as we are about it, mm -hmm. right? Well, and also they were very receptive to listening to about yeah. how how the, like they were very, um, Representative Gifford was super receptive, but yes. to hearing how the classroom has changed as well. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, especially coming out of COVID, children have a lot of different issues that weren't there socially and emotionally. And it's very different for teachers and what they're dealing with. And they were, it, it just felt really good to he have that confirmation that, yes, we understand that you're struggling and we want to know how can we make it better. So that it was, I felt it was a very positive experience. Right, I thought it was great. So thankful that we had the opportunity to go and looking forward to, um, next year hopefully having a bigger group and i have to say the culinary students the lunch that they put on was fabulous it was fun. it was so it's great tremendous. to see um right to see it was so great to see so many students um there serving talking mm -hmm. about the meals that they made um talking about their schools um showing their school pride it was um it was just a great great <clears throat> overall day and we well, had a tour. We'll have to advocate for the conference. I was going to say that. Right? Well, yeah. I did, I right now, they do only invite the vocational schools. With so the, they, the they building. Don't, they don't invite any public school programs. Maybe we could be like, uh, we got pathways, though. Well. Maybe, well, <laughs> maybe well, push to have our counter group. Yes, I did ask. Mm -hmm. I did ask how, um, how schools are able to attend. Um, and they said that you just have to ask. All right, so, we'll ask. so if we're if we're ready next year, and if we're in a position next we're year, then nice I say that we um, we extend it and see if we can participate, because that would be amazing to see our students have that opportunity. Oh, but they were open to that concept, which was great, because I I did ask, because I thought, well, right, we have this great new culinary project coming on coming up. Um, Granted, our students do amazing things with what they have now, yeah. but I'm sure it can only expand between now and then. But it was really great to hear the students and see how excited they were to talk about yeah. the food they prepared. It was great. So I would love to have our students be able to have that opportunity. So um, thank you to everyone that came with us. And um, hopefully next year, we'll have a bigger group. But thank you, Scott, for um, putting that on the agenda so we could share that more greatness a day of advocacy for public education and for our district and it's great that we have um representative gifford who was like you said so interested in hearing the student voice it was great she yeah. really wanted to hear directly from them so um it was great that they all accepted that and um shared some of their stories so 
with that, I believe that brings us to upcoming events. Yep. It does. Okay, I'm on, uh, I'm on a paper agenda because yeah, I only so have yeah. one screen, so I'm, I'm oh, no. so I think what I have printed might be, it might be a little out of order. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a large number of events, which I kind of come up, Ooh, they're yes. not coming up on the screen, is, so that's okay. It is unbelievable. <laughs> so it's amazing how much things are going on in the district yep. uh, over the next, really month, there's only five weeks of school left. Uh, yep. You know, before we get to the end of school on, on June, um, 16th on June 16th so when you when you look at this calendar which I'm not sure why it's not coming up in the share on the screen so sorry for those in zoom who can't see it um, but all, all this information is available uh, on the uh, school district calendar on the website um, with a lot of events coming up obviously school committee take a look at these events obviously you're invited to participate in, in all of these things that are going on you know um, so I'm not going to go through and highlight any specific events here. Can I? Lot, can I make a happening. quick plug? You can make you the members of the committee can plug any events they'd like to plug. I <laughs> I would really like to plug Thursday night, the 18th multicultural night at the elementary school. It starts at 6:30. Uh, Miss Miss Cramp, the music teacher, uh, and the DEI committee have been working extremely hard to make this a super fun welcoming event um, where you can learn about multiculturalism and there'll be food trucks and games and dancing and I and music and music and I am really sad that I will be on a plane to Ireland it, and miss and this. I believe I believe the event actually does kick off at five. I it's five. Oh it's five. Okay, yeah, five. sorry. Yeah. My bad. No, I read okay. the wrong thing. So yeah. five PM Five uh, to I wrote, yeah, I wrote the wrong time. Five to seven thirty on I'm not Thursday sure if it's night. I think four thirty. Is, I think the four thirty is set up time. Yeah. 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 Um, elementary school. Be there or be square. <laughs> Can I just add that from four thirty to five, it's a sensory friendly opportunity, oh, nice. and yeah. then at five, that's when in mass people can come. Oh, that's wonderful! I'm so glad that we had that opportunity for for students and families. Thank you for pointing that out. Appreciate that, but yes, this calendar is is packed full of amazing. So check check out the website, uh, go right? to the school yeah. district website and the school calendar, Definitely. and there's uh, all kinds of events happening over the next month uh, in the Calder Public Schools. Like, I'm genuinely sad that I won't be here for it. Are you coming to Jam Fest? <sighs> right? Yeah, I am. I love a good new right? I'm, I'm going to yeah. try to fit it in. We have the. Um, I've already committed to that. At the so middle high school that night too. I've so. committed to that already. I'm gonna try to, to see volunteer. if I can do both, but we shall see. But it's great to see so many um, amazing things. So hopefully, people will come out and support our students and support our staff that have worked really hard to put on some of these mm -hmm. events. So attendance would be greatly appreciated. So that's going to bring us to recommendations from the superintendent. And we're going to turn over to Ron, who's going to do uh, some financial updates and the FY23 budget transfers. Thank you, Ron. Yep. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, so I'll get you started with a couple of updates um, at the federal and state level, starting over in Washington. You've got an update from the EPA that recently announced some proposed changes to emission standards. Why am I sharing with you EPA announcements? Um, because buried in those, there's a 2027 deadline that does impact school buses. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, the emission standards are going to be decreasing starting 2027 through the early 2030s. Um, there's two takeaways as a school community that you should be aware of regarding that. The first is we're currently in the process of exploring uh, application for the EPA Clean School Bus Grant. It's the second tranche of five um, billion that has been earmarked for clean and, and improved emission school buses across the country. Uh, the first tranche was a reimbursement um, process and so this is their first grant process. Um, we're applying for FY24 uh, with a goal of utilizing a combination of grant and capital funds if we're ultimately awarded to do a pilot program for electric vehicles, school buses here in Carver. I um, want to temper expectations. I've been going through all the regulations on it. They are prioritizing high needs communities and urban centers primarily, so urban and high rural, and we're sort of in the middle of that. Uh, so we don't fall into any of their top priority categories, but we're going to apply anyway. We'll make an effort to see if we can't get the funding for it. The EV vehicles are uh, very expensive, about four times the price of a typical bus. 
Uh, but ultimately, if we don't get that funding, we'll continue to work with Massachusetts Environmental Protection as well as all of our vendors to meet those new requirements if they are ultimately enacted. So I'll keep you posted on both the grant and as the EPA sort of tweaks and finalizes the rules when public comment is closed. Great, thank you. Uh, Beacon Hill has been busy. Uh, I'm sure you're, you've heard a lot about the you know state budget development that's underway. I think at our last meeting, I gave you an update on House Ways and Means. They passed their budget, which is great. You know, 56.2 billion. I gave you the update on that at our last meeting. It's now on to the Senate. They've already started their work. Senate Ways and Means released their budget. I have a link there for you if you want to take a look at the the gruesome details. But I'll give you a couple of brief highlights, um, sort of the highlights across the board. So the first is what's uh, some, some positive news. Senate Ways um, and Means supports that minimum Chapter 78 increase from 30 to 60. It's not a huge impact for Carver, but we are one of 172 districts in the Commonwealth that only receive minimum aid. So I think that's a nice nod that the governor, that the House, and uh, the Senate have all agreed that there needs to be some increase in Chapter 70 for those districts that are only getting the minimum aid, Carver being one of those 172. Uh, and their appropriation matches all the other um, you know, branches at $6.5 billion for statewide education. Similarly, uh, the Senate also has language that mirrors the governors and the houses regarding a mechanism to be determined to support schools in absorbing that 14% increase on out-of-district special education costs for 766 schools. That's phenomenal. No details on exactly what that mechanism looks like, but my assumption would be once the appropriation, if it's finalized, goes through, then DESE would work out rolling out the rules, the regulatory rules, and how that would work. Uh, another benefit that would really help out Carver in particular is that the Senate matches the governor and the House with increases to homeless transportation reimbursement. You've probably heard me at the past, gosh, I don't know, maybe three or four meetings now on transfers, um, requiring some internal transfers to cover increases in homeless student transportation needs. Those are costs that we typically don't anticipate. Um, we have a general budget for it, but it fluctuates year to year. And this year in particular, Carver is one of many districts across the Commonwealth that have seen a really high number of new homeless students and homeless families. So it's our obligation to support those families, but those costs can be very significant. And I'm happy to see the Senate showing an increase there, about six million statewide for that reimbursement tranche. That'll be a huge appropriation if that goes through. Um, Oh, uh, the non-resident vocational transportation, Senate matched the governor with that $5 million in statewide reimbursement. It's less of an impact here in Carver. Our numbers are just a little bit lower, but that would be another benefit for us in terms of transportation uh, reimbursement. Uh, the one that we don't see in the Senate Ways and Means is that they didn't recommend that universal school lunch program as part of their FY24. House and governor both included that as you know the 161 for their um, approval in the budget. It doesn't mean it doesn't go through yet. It just means this is going to be part of the negotiation process as they as the sausage is made when it comes to building the FY24 state budget. But we'll keep a close eye on that. I know there's been a lot of advocacy already, food service directors, business managers, school committees certainly uh, advocating for the Senate to reconsider their position on that, and we'll keep you posted there. Uh, lastly, when it comes to the state budget, an interesting bit of news came out just a couple of uh, weeks ago. So if you follow any of the tax revenues, April's tax revenues came in really low, surprisingly low at the state level. Uh, you have the data here, April you know, brought in about $4.7 billion. That's just about $2 billion less than last year and about $1.5 billion less than what's projected. That's pretty substantial. Ultimately, at this point, it puts the state in the red by you know, $703 million, so just shy of a billion dollars. It's not short money. Uh, hearing some of the statements from a variety of lawmakers, the governor included, uh, the large majority of voices have sort of taken this wait and see approach to it that this is only one data point and they're certainly not wrong about that uh, but we're really getting close to the end of the fiscal year so this was a surprising turn for state receipts and state revenue two things i'd ask the committee to keep in the back of your mind the reasons i share this data with you the first is this data will probably color the senate's perspective on what they think about for fy24 how they want to shape the budget conversation the negotiations around you know what discretionary funding they want to use. Uh, and the second is that we should just keep a close eye on this. Um, October 15th, we do the budget reconciliation at the state level. Uh, there's been no talk right now of 9C cuts, but if that 
is not a blip and becomes a trend, then we may be bracing for 9C cuts at the state level. Uh, and that's something that we need to be cautious of when we sort of wade into the budget in July. We'll take an especially conservative approach to our spending early on in the budget process until that reconciliation in October goes through at the state level, at which time we can take a little bit of a, a sigh of relief. They'll have a lot more data in terms of receipts for 24. Want to give a little quick definition of a 9C cut? Sorry. Nine. <laughs> so uh, we've been very fortunate with all the COVID money recently. This hasn't been a conversation at the state level in a long time. Chapter 29, Section 9C essentially tells the uh, state of Massachusetts through the governor that you have to have a balanced budget. And if you don't, it authorizes the governor to work with the legislature to make cuts mid-year so that you have a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges of 9C cuts is that if those 9C cuts hit Chapter 70, right? Or they hit, you know, general um, general municipal funding streams, a variety of those. You've already started spending the money. So if you do get a 9C cut in October, November, December, you're a quarter or a half or a third of the way through the spending, and so it just makes it even harder to be able to sort of catch up with that decrease in revenue, right? So that's my big takeaway is, you know, this is not a, a panic button by any stretch of the imagination at the state level. This is just a caution, pump the brake a little bit. We'll be especially conservative when it comes to spending early on in the fiscal year and keep you posted on that. Sorry, thank you. Um, you've got your warrants there down to the penny as always, payroll expenses through the quarter four. Uh, we're almost done with the fiscal year. FY23 is coming to a close. I'll share with you the transfers uh, and your budget update in detail, as always. So you've got your FY23 budget, every account there, updated uh, for May. Um, again, I'll answer any questions you've got on the budget in general, but I think first just give you a couple of highlights from your transfers. This is probably one of your last transfers before we start to close out the fiscal year. Um, Maybe four highlights here come to mind. The first is we just do a spring encumbrance. So folks that do lane changes and those sorts of things, adjustments in salary, we re-encumber the funds and then transfer accordingly to you know, adjust as needed. So you'll see that a bunch of different times on your transfers. Um, the other transfer to bring your attention to, we had uh, a lot of great updates in the athletics programs, baseball, softball, fencing, some additional equipment. There were some campus improvements if you've been down to the middle high school. We did the wind screens and those sorts of things, as well as an invoice sweep uh, to close out some of our winter uh, invoices as well. Um, as we've talked about the past couple of months, we had some increases in special education out of district costs, so a combination of tuitions, testing, and transportation. You'll see that reflecting your, um, your, your transfers there. And then some um, you know, unexpected costs when it comes to repairs, so pipe and valve repairs over the middle high school, uh, electrician costs for some lights, water system maintenance, those sorts of things. In general, FY23 coming to a close, you're in really good shape for the fourth quarter, which is nice. Uh, I feel fortunate to be able to report that to you. And uh, as we get probably to the end of it, I'll give you maybe one more closeout so we can see us wrapping up the, the fiscal year. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions on this report. Anyone have any questions? No? Thank you, Ron, for all Thanks. of that detail and sure. for um, all of the tidbits that you bring to us. Sure. It's, uh, I think we all appreciate your sharing that information with us. We'll keep you posted. As regularly as you do, so thank you very much for that. Yeah. Um, so with that, we do need a motion um, to approve the um, budget transfers. I will make a motion to approve the fiscal year 23 budget transfers. I will second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Again, thank, thank you, Ron. Yes. Thank you. Brings us to policy. <laughs> All right, so policy, uh, we're going to policy our way out. There's a lot of policy here. Yep. Um, we have four policies that needed additional time to complete the, the review of as part of our general overview review of all the policy manual. So uh, we've been able to complete the review of those four policies and we're going to bring those forward tonight. So they were sections in the previous uh, areas of the policy manual that we just weren't ready to act on at that time. Because uh, we needed some input, most of them, all, actually all of them, because we needed some input from outside resources, whether it be uh, the school district's attorney, uh, the doctors in the case of the AED policy, um, and then our own technology staff. So I'll take you through these four policies, if that's okay. Great, thank uh, you. The first one is 
um, policy GBE BBA E, Educator Ethics and Protocols. Um, this is actually a policy that we adopted uh, several years ago, and it really talks about uh, maintaining appropriate boundaries for staff uh, and staff's interactions with students. Uh, and really the updates here is the policy was a little bit outdated uh, because it made references to things like MySpace. Like that's a very specific example. Uh, and so there's not major changes to this policy. Uh, we just updated them to reflect uh, more current language in terms of you know, ma maintaining appropriate boundaries with students in regards to the internet and social media. Uh, and made more general statements in regards to social media instead of naming specific like social media platforms like MySpace, uh, which I don't, I don't think anybody's still on MySpace. Maybe, maybe someone out there is still on MySpace. Uh, so, and we did, we also wanted the attorneys to review this policy. Uh, so they have taken a look at it. Uh, they have reviewed it. Um, so I'll open it up to any questions anybody might have on this policy. Uh, we, remember no action is required this evening, so this evening is our first reading of all four of these policies. Uh, and then any suggestions or questions people have, we can come back and get some answers uh, for our second reading where we'd actually look to move forward uh, and approve these policies. Uh, so any questions on the educator ethics and protocols? So if it's okay, I'm just going to go through all four, if that works. Great right. Thank you. Uh, so the second policy was policy EBBA, Automated External Defibrillators, or AEDs. Uh, it's actually a policy that we're required to have. And as part of this policy, we're actually required to work uh, with a local medical professional, uh, specifically uh, an ER doctor. Um, so this policy was actually developed uh, in conjunction with Dr. Daniel Muse, uh, who specializes in emergency medicine uh, at, well, he was at Brockton Hospital. Not exactly sure where he is right, where he is right now, because <laughs> Bro Brockton Hospital currently is not open. Uh, but that is his background and that is his training. Uh, so this policy was actually uh, written and developed uh, with our school nurse who is here, Karen Schoen, uh, and the, who is the school district's nurse leader, uh, in conjunction with Dr. Daniel Muse. Uh, and as part of this, Dr. Muse has agreed to serve at, in the role of medical director who oversees our AEDs. Uh, so, and his, that's his specialty. Uh, so he has actually uh, reviewed and approved this policy uh, as it is proposed here uh, for, this, for you this evening. Um, and again, I would open it up to any questions you might have about uh, the updated AED policy. I, I will say I haven't been pulling them all up on home, uh, but I can if people want, uh, just because it's sometimes a quick transition that Zoom is right, very accepting of. Uh, the next one is uh, policy ECAF uh, as a policy on security cameras. So this is a policy actually that we currently didn't have as a school district, uh, though we do have security systems on both security cameras on both our campuses, uh, both e external security cameras and internal security cameras. Uh, so what we did is we used the basis of the MASC recommendation for a security camera policy. Uh, but I felt that this was a policy that was a, a really appropriate for um, our attorneys to weigh in on. Uh, so we brought this to uh, Stolen Chandler and Miller. We asked them to review the MASC policy and make some recommendations. So the policy you have before you this evening uh, it was actually written by the school district attorneys. Uh, and so they took the MASC as a draft and then revised it uh, to create the security camera policy as it's written here this evening. Uh, and certainly we'd be supportive of uh, following our attorney's recommendations on our policy in regards to security cameras. No questions. Uh, the last one was acceptable use of technology. Uh, this was actually reviewed by our technology team uh, who has developed the suggested revisions to the apologies. In, in the big picture, the changes are minor and reflect uh, really some updated language in, in terms of terminology. Um, you know, the policy subcommittee had some questions for me that I brought back uh, to the technology staff. Uh, the technology staff hasn't uh, addressed all of those concerns yet. 
Uh, so Kelly, I don't know. I was actually thinking it might be a good suggestion. Maybe you and maybe we touch base again on this prior to our next meeting. Yes. Because uh, they had some thoughts and suggestions that they'd uh, like to discuss. Because we know this is your expertise yeah. a little bit. Sure. Uh, so they'd like to talk to you about that a little bit and get some of your feedback. Absolutely. Uh, so if, if you're okay with me setting something up prior to our next meeting sure. to have that discussion, specifically it was specifically about the password issue. Yes. Uh, they, mm -hmm. So they had some different recommendations about passwords. Uh, that was really that was really the biggest thing right, here, perfect, yeah. uh, and then uh, looking at our old policy, they liked some of the language. Um, um, I'm gonna pull up a specific guy. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm gonna pull up my own reference. Uh, so they they did like some of the language uh, regarding about uh, monitored use, and we actually took some language from the old policy and embedded it Good. into Good. this policy. Uh, based on some of the suggestions the policy subcommittee made. Uh, so this is, I think this is still needs a couple tweaks in it. Uh, and if everybody's okay with that, uh, we'll, maybe I'll have Kelly touch base with our technology staff and, and finalize those pieces to come back uh, for our next meeting in June. Happy to. That would be great. Thank you, Kelly, for yeah. doing that. Okay. I appreciate you using your area of expertise to um, send these out get this daily. where it needs to be. So. <laughs> Thank you for um, thank you for that input. Yeah, and, and as I said, the, that <coughs> summary, the overview. You know, each of these four policies were policies we, uh, as the, the members of the policy subcommittee, uh, Stephanie and Jen, at that time, you know, didn't really feel like uh, we had the expertise really to answer right. some of these questions. So we felt like these were policies we really need to work with some other people to get some input. You know, as I said, uh, the school district attorneys, Dr. Muse, technology, uh, and to make sure that we were. Uh, solid on these four policies. Uh, as I said, no action is required on any of these policies this evening, uh, but we would look to bring them back for a second meeting uh, in our meeting on June 5th. Okay. Great. Great. So that brings us to a second reading of policy sections K and L um, of the policy manual, which will actually complete our overview of the policy manual, which we've been doing throughout this school year. Uh, Section K and L were really small sections with minimal changes. In many instances, we've updated our policies based on the current MASC recommendations. Um, in section L, we actually eliminated more policies than we did in terms of anything else because they were outdated. Um, so just a couple key changes from section K and section L. Uh, section K uh, for policy KBBA, uh, non-custodial parent rights. Uh, we adopted this MASC policy that is actually a policy we did not have, um, but it's an important, it, that policy is aligned with the role, the, the, the rights and responsibilities that non-custodial parents have in terms of their students' education and aligns right with the law uh, on that issue. Uh, policy KBE, uh, Relations with Parent Booster Organizations, was actually uh, replaces our current policy, which is KJA, Relations with Booster Organizations. It kind of expands that out to discuss parents. And policy KCE, Public Complaints About Curriculum or Instruction Materials. This is actually a duplicate policy. It already exists in section I of the policy manual. Uh, it lived in two places, uh, and we felt like that didn't make sense to have the same policy live in two different places. Uh, so we're recommending that we stay with it in section I, but eliminate it from section K. Uh, within section L, policy LBC relations with homeschools, uh, we're proposing to eliminate it. Again, this policy was actually a little bit of a duplicate of, a, of our homeschool policy that already exists in section I of the policy manual. Uh, and same with policy LBCA, relations with non-public schools. We're also proposing to eliminate this policy because it is also uh, redundant uh, to policies that already exist in Section I. Section I is the section uh, the policy manual about students. Uh, so these things in terms of homeschool and relationship with non-public schools, uh, there was some duplication there between Section L and Section I of the policy manual. So you know, our proposal would be that we move uh, Section K and L uh, in form this evening. And remember, we've been doing that throughout the process as we approve a section in form. And uh, then our goal would be uh, in June uh, that we'd bring back the four policies from this evening that we did the first reading of for a second reading. Mm -hmm. And after those policies were approved, then we'd have a, mo then we'd have a discussion about approving uh, the revised policy manual in total because that would, we have covered all the sections. Uh, that's if we receive a motion to approve sections K and L uh, in form this evening. I move to approve sections K and L of the policy manual in form as presented this evening. I second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yes, this is something that we've been working on all year. 
Um, we're, so, we're, we're so close to the finish line and it's really going to be um, exciting um, when it's completed and everything's up on the website and the links will be there to all the policies and all the laws. Um, I know that we have some of them linked on our website now, um, but they'll be, you know. The reality is many of our policies are outdated. Uh, oh, so because we had the school committee had not gone through a process of revising the entire policy manual in many years. Especially if it's uh, so a it So it was something that, it was something that needed to something that needed to happen. Uh, so I want to thank uh, you know Stephanie and Jen originally and now Kelly uh, for their work on the policy subcommittee to um, spend a lot of time going through each of these policies. Uh, uh, and comparing them to the MSAC, MASC recommendations, and then when appropriate, uh, you know, seeking other advice as well. Yeah, it's been great to be able to um, have that opportunity to collaborate and ask questions and say, hey, you just, is this the best fit for our district? Um, I think it's been great to have that opportunity. Like I said earlier, thank you, Kelly, for your willingness to share with your, your IT knowledge there. Um, and it's been great that we could have um, some feedback from our attorneys also. Um, to make sure, like I said, that we have policies that work for us um, in the best interest of our district. So I will be very excited once that is um, <laughs> all tied up very neatly in a bow. Um, so yeah, thank you to everyone for their, their time. So that brings us to a very, one of my favorite things that we do as a school committee, field trips. <laughs> yeah, so we have two field trip proposals, one for Camp Burgess, um, this will be a sixth grade trip in October of next year. Uh, Camp Burgess will be replacing Camp Borndale, so they're looking to use a different facility this year than Camp Borndale, uh, for, but similar type of trip in terms of its uh, experience. Uh, and then also looking to approve the Europe trip to Portugal and Spain actually two years out in April of 2025. Yeah. Next year's trip was approved last year. Mm -hmm. uh, they try to approve two years out really because they have to go through the process. These, the trip is expensive, yeah. and they do mm -hmm. give families the opportunity, uh, you know, really to pay for this over an extended period of time. Yeah. Uh, so the approval of the trip for two years from now actually begins to allow families to start enrolling in that trip now. Mm -hmm. So, so just I did a motion make to a approve. motion to um, approve the both field trips for grade six to Camp Burgess and Sandwich of October 2023, and for the um, middle high school European trip to Portugal and Spain of April of 2025. I will second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I look forward to hearing more about um, those experiences. Perhaps we could um, invite um, someone to come speak about the programming especially where we have a new experience at Camp Burgess. It would be great if we could get some of the kids to come and yeah. share their share their experience and have some of the um, you know, chaperones or um, some of the teachers that are there with them. We got an agenda item for the next time. Come November. share, hmm. yeah. <laughs> right? Um, I mean, the kids that are going to Europe are certainly welcome to come to come report to us and, and share their travels. I feel like um, you need a school committee chaperone. I, I was going to say trip. that. When does the school committee get invited? Because that that's what I would like to join. <laughs> right? I know. Um, so grateful that our students have these amazing opportunities and that we have um, teachers that are willi willing to facilitate um, these opportunities. It's really great. Like I said, it's one of, it's one of my favorite things that we do. Okay, so that brings us to um, reports from the school committee. And I'm just gonna go to my background agenda because the one I have printed doesn't have um, everything on there because it's a little outdated. So um, a few things have come to um, my attention. So we just have some housekeeping that we're gonna do um, as a committee. Um, one of which is um, some open meeting law training. Um, I did share with the committee that there is um, a scheduled training on Wednesday at 1 p.m. I realize it's during the day and might not be convenient for um, those of us who work full time. Um, but it is something to be um, mindful of. Um, we did have a training a few years ago. Um, they do offer them on a regular basis. Um, will we have those acknowledgement forms um, available to the committee for this year? I went through my binder, but my binder is six years old. Almost, so, well, yeah, six-ish years old, so. We certainly can. Okay, so I would just like to make sure that we have um, everything 
um, I guess, in, that we need so to have in writing. I, do you want me to address that specifically? Sure. So the, the, one of the requirements of the open meeting law is that when you come on to the school committee, you're given a copy of the open meeting law with a signature form that you accept, that you've received the copy of the open meeting law. Uh, every member of the school committee, uh, when they join the school committee, receives a binder uh, from my office. That binder includes the open meeting law and the certificate. Uh, so we can reproduce that again. We can have everybody uh, get a copy of the open meeting law and have you sign the certificate again. Because we do not, also we don't have everybody's certificate. Yep. So I just Acknowledging wanna... that you received the open meeting law when you became a member of the school committee. Right. And I'm trying to think, did we do acknowledgements or certificates when we did our training two years ago? I honestly couldn't. No, I remember so we, no, I, I didn't no, think we, we did, did them as part of that process. Was, so. Uh, no, so it was part of the training that we did Wait. two years ago with uh, the school district's uh, law firm. Yeah. Uh, there was not a, you didn't have to sign an acknowledgement. The other thing we can mention is that uh, as part of the MASA, MASC China the course course Correct. that all new school community members yep. take, uh, open meeting law training is part of that course as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so members of the school committee have uh, many opportunities uh, to be made aware of the open meeting law, one through receiving it, uh, second through the training of charting the course. Correct. Thank you. I just want to make sure that um, like moving forward that we're maintaining our own records as a committee. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I wanted to ask our, our secretary to manage for mm -hmm. us. Um, okay. So on an annual basis we can review and make sure that we're all on track um, and that we're um, being good stewards. Um, so also on there um, is the state ethics training. So every two years um, all state county municipal employees must complete a conflict of interest law online training program. So whether you're newly elected or appointed, um, you're supposed to complete it within 30 days um, at the beginning of your public service year and then every two years thereafter. So one year it's an acknowledgement form that you've received it and then one is to actually complete the online training. I have a question about that. Yes. Uh, I know that the state recently changed. They have an online the, program now. Well, but, but it's sorry. it's still different than because I because I also have to take the state ethics in my profession. Okay. So and it, it's a two year thing, but we had to retake it this year. Correct. Yes. So we yes. even though it's been less than two years, we still have Correct. to retake yes. it. Yes, and they we have, have until June 9th to yes. complete it. Okay. We have until yeah. June to complete it. Thank it's you. a new um, yeah. online training program that they opened in January. So we do have until um, June to complete that. And then once we complete it, um, it actually creates a certificate that's online. So again, um, I would just like us as, as a committee just to yeah. ensure that every mm -hmm. year, um, especially as we have new members come on, um, that we just make sure everyone's aware of the training that they're required to take so that, again, we can make sure that um, we are performing our responsibilities and our duties as school committee members to the fullest extent of the law and, and being in compliance. And we will be sending our certificates to Gina? Um, Does you can, it uh, you can access them online, anything? correct? I don't know, do you need that? Do you want us to send them? them? Yeah, the, oh, what no, okay, so I didn't yeah. have there's, to send it to Yeah, because there's okay. like a right. thing. The new, the new system tracks it online. Right. So that's new this year. Yep. Yeah. Prior to this year, you had to print out your certificate and turn it into the school, and then the school mm -hmm. turned it into the town clerk, actually. Yep. Uh, but uh, this year, they went to a totally online system, so there's yeah. no requirement uh, to print any certificates. Uh, they are, it's tracked. Yeah. Uh, right. through a so, database. So if you haven't used that new system either, you do have to create an account for yourself as well. Yeah, correct. And I have to take two different ethics ones. <laughs> it's yeah, like the one, same but different. different it's different for a committee member than it is for, for the educator. Correct. Yeah, yeah I, I, when I went through it, I, I didn't really feel that there was a category that was 100% geared towards school committee. No, so I took the one for education and then I also did the one for um, municipal committees. That's what it's municipal committees. Yeah. So I did I did both because yeah. I'm like I want to see what the educator portion of this looks like so I just put that for me. Um, inquiring minds. So do I have to take it twice. You took it twice for fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, you're, I did. You're right because I, I was like what am I missing? What, I don't know what, how fun that is. What, but... are, what are their questions? Well I was just I was <laughs> curious. So um, and I enjoy learning. So, um, just it was harder. I'm going to say it was harder this time. It was. Like, because it, it was harder. I thought it was great. I loved that the videos were updated. Oh, just yes. What I'm going to say. Some of, some of the videos that were out there were um, previously were 
Uh, very outdated, but um, I thought it was very helpful. We, and, and Can we provide feedback to them about the training? Oh, absolutely. Because I don't know, I, I, when you took it, there's like all these like flashy things that come up during yep. some of the questions, mm -hmm. and it takes like a minute to two minutes for that flashy little bar to show on the screen, so you think that it's stuck, yep. and then you try to refresh it, and it makes you start the whole thing all oh, over nice. again. Because it's trying to bring in like flashy screen stuff. Well, and like also it, it yep. took like when you finish, it takes forever to get confirmation. Yes. So <laughs> somebody that I worked with, she thought she hadn't passed it because she hadn't she'd gotten she hadn't gotten a hundred, and she was retook it six times before she finally got the email that was like, "You're fine." Please stop. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. It was definitely uh, a little glitchy, but a um, glitchy. right. Yeah. So I just wanted to be um, transparent in in terms of us, you know, moving forward. Like I said, um, and um, right, because we want to be able to serve the community, and we also want people to be able to um, have faith that we are um, performing. Um, as we should be, right? And taking all the training that we should be in and being as transparent as we can be with our um, meeting agendas and our minutes um, that are posted on our um, school website and will continue to be posted on our school website moving forward. So just a couple of um, housekeeping things that I wanted to do because um, as, again, my involvement with MASC increases and I speak to other school clean members across the Commonwealth and then with NSBA across the country, I learn best practices and I learn how other committees um, are performing and, and things that they're tracking and how their um, officers are fulfilling um, their roles. So I would like to continue to um, have us have discussions about improving and growing and being the best that we can be. <laughs> so um, those were my few things. Um, does anyone else have anything they would like to report before we go into executive session? OK. Colleen, no? OK, so with that, um, really quickly, calendar is super full. Like we mentioned earlier, everything's on our website. So please go to our website. Please come out. Please support our students. Please fill those seats. Um, the kids love to see people in the audience and love to feel your support. So um, with that, I would um, entertain a motion. I, mm, I, where is it? I don't have it on my agenda. Very last item. It's not on my written one or I would give it to you. Yeah, nope. it's not on my background agenda. Yeah. I make a motion to close the public session and open an executive session to review complaints filed with the Carver School Committee on May 5th, 2023 and May 9th, 2023 under the opening meeting law against one or more members of the school committee. Mm -hmm. Not to return to open session. Not to return to open session. I will second. Can I ask a question? These kids have to get a form signed for that um, to trust the site. And then also there's kids on Zoom. So how do they get credit? Do you print up an attendance? No. I. They, I've been signing them all. I know that it's, I feel like Mr. Tresco's whole class attended this evening, which is yes. great. Yeah. So, uh, so I may, maybe I should go to the, their class. Their class and just sign <laughs> them all. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So I will, if you bring your forms down the office, I will come by and sign them all. Is, yes. it, is it a particular class of Mr. Tresco's? What period is it? I know we have the whole tenth grade on tonight. Right, we have we have thirty two people on Zoom. Right. Other than our That's panelists. So, so I, <laughs> thank you all I, for attending. I will, I will work with Mr. Tresco and figure out the way for us to sign off okay. the community service. And it's yeah. actually it was supposed to be an hour, but it's an hour and forty five minutes. Yeah, it'll be two hours. Get, okay. They'll get two hours. Every, every, everyone who attends the team will get two hours of community <laughs> okay. service. Yeah. Go you guys. Yeah. And everybody who's yeah. watching on everybody who's watching on Zoom, I'll work with Mr. Tresco and we'll figure out a way for me to sign everybody's form uh, over the next couple of days. If you if you have your form right now, I'll sign. If you have your form here, I'll sign it. Yeah. Right. Again, some housekeeping. Thank you to um, Mr. Tresco for inviting all of his students to attend our meeting this evening via um, in person or virtually. I hope that you all learned something. And we're certainly here if you have any questions. 
And I, you know, if you want to come to public comment at any motion. point in time, feel free to come share your voices with us because, again, we all love to hear from our students. Okay, so we have a motion out there. So yeah. we do have a motion out there. I will second. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second, and this should be a roll call vote. So we'll just go right around the table. So just say your name and then I. Jackie, I. Kelly Lake. There you go. Yep. Kelly Nini, I. Katie Sullivan, I. Stephanie Clarity, I. Thank you, everyone. Thank that you. ends our Thank open you. session at 8.45 p.m.